This is the story about Nomfundo. Nomfundo is 21, and she is studying gender studies. She is in her second year. On Tuesday morning, she walks into a colonized classroom. Then, shortly, the white lecturer walks in. She comes in and she greets the students and lets them know what the lecture will be about for that day. She takes out lecture slides, writes on the board, The students take out their stationery and start taking down notes from the lecturer. One student is sleeping, another is bored and tired. And then as the lecture goes on, the students start to get a little bit restless and start to talk to each other. One of them speaks in an African language to which the lecturer reprimands bluntly. And the lecturer then shuts them up and tells them to settle down. The lecturer then asks a question. Then two of the learners lift up their hands to respond. When Nomfundo responds, the lecturer doesn't seem very satisfied by her answer and asks her to read more about the topic. But when one of the other, more intelligent students answers, she smiles with approval, nods ahead at how much he knows. Then she rolls out homework questions. She reads the question. Now this is the only one chance for you to pass this module. Write an essay on Western feminist theory and critically evaluate them against events in Europe and North America in the 60s. The essay has to be structured, structured, okay, with proper referencing. It is an offense to plagiarize. I won't bother marking your essay if there's no proper referencing. I won't mark it. You lose the mark, okay? You're not even going to get a 50. You will fail should you not adhere to these rules. Now, go and do your work. Now, it's very clear that the students in this environment aren't learning very much. Some of them are failing, and the lecturer is discomforted. One of the students talks to the lecturer. Now, the lecturer undergoes a decolonial turn. <laughs> now, this is the story of Unom Fundo, and she is 21. She is studying gender studies at UNISA, and she is in her second year. In this class, we have students from different backgrounds who represent different nationalities and different cultures sexual orientations, who are multilingual and are accepted for who they are and what they bring to the learning situation. On Tuesday, 
Unomfundo walks into a decolonized classroom. Unomfundo walks in, greets the students in her own native language, Sanbonani Bangani. She sits down and joins in. The lecturer sits with the students and converses with them. They're in an interactive circle in which they're talking about gender inequality. The lecturer is happily engaging and facilitating this discussion with the students. The students are interacting with each other, not only taking in knowledge, but creating it themselves. The students are free to speak in their own languages. This class is lively, and the lecturer and in, then engages with the students. Power is shared, not held by the lecturer. The lecturer isn't the only one writing on the board. There is no monop monotony in this lecture. Learning is fun and interactive. It is decolonial, fearless, and exciting. Students are truly engaged with the material. The decolonial classroom looks like the nursery classroom that we all started off in, which was fun, lively. It's not the boring classroom where we were just reading and writing. The students aren't the only ones who are learning. Wepudi, wepudi, wepudi mnagi hamba nawe. Ay, wepudi, wepudi, wepudi mnagi hamba nawe. So the students aren't the only ones learning. The curriculum also relates to who they are. It speaks to who they are. It represents who they are. The students aren't empty subjects, but are creators and molders of knowledge. They are free to disagree non-violently. After this, the lecturer gives out a question for them to answer for an assignment. It reads, Describe an event from your personal experience where gender or sexuality was used to marginalize or inferiorize another human being. Your description may take any form. For example, a play, a poem, a song, or a story. Use two different comparative lenses to analyze the situation. For example, African womanism, African traditional folklore, Western feminism, or another of your choice. In your presentation, show what stance you would take or how you would engage in agency, activism, creativity to change the situation. You may send your draft or notes about your ideas to your lecturer before you finalize your submission. And cut. Molweni, Sanbonani, Jimelang, Loshani. Uh, my name is Nobi Sasigaba, and um, I'm a master's student in the College of Human Sciences. And um, I think this play reflects a lot of um, our upbringing, particularly as, as, as black students within the academy. And also just, you know, uh, within the, the, the schooling system itself. So what we have done today is to bring out our views as students as to what is it that we envision a decolonized curriculum and pedagogy of teaching and learning to, to, to look like. So uh, on Saturday, we obviously had um, a pre-festival where we had these discussions. And this is one of the things that um, came about was, was this, this play that tells the story of um, our teaching and our learning environment and what we would hope 
a decolonized university to look like. So today my presentation, it's um, student views on transforming pedagogy, curriculum, and assessment. And um, one of the first things that obviously I'd like to speak about is obviously defining the term coloniality. What is coloniality? And when we speak about coloniality, what are we talking about? So when defining the term coloniality, many critics associate it with colon colonialism and colonization, which is often said to be an experience of the past. Um, and also in the South African dispensation, we speak about apartheid, which is um, you know, uh, an ideology of colonialism. So when we talk about those concepts, we are often told that these are experiences of the past and now we are in a rainbow nation or we are in a you know, um, multi-democratic um, society. And those experiences are no longer relevant to where we are today as a country and where we are today as a globalized world. So expressions of modernity then force students and academics to be, um, to be interested um, in experiences of the colonized and to think of it as things that are in, in the past. So as students, our experiences and the experiences of our forefathers never come forth into what we call the modern um, university. So what then is coloniality and in the context of decolonization? So what this presentation seeks to do then is to speak to the experiences of the subaltern people of the world and how they relate to such systems as the economic, social, and political landscape, particularly within the environment of the modern Western university. So the focus of this paper is on the experiences and views of black students within the institutions of higher learning. And the term black in the context of this presentation refers to a particular group of people on the subaltern line of human existence who have been denied humanity ontological and epistem epistemic existence. The black consciousness definition of black, therefore, is the premise upon which um, black is defined in this presentation. So, when st students talk about a free decolonized education, what are they referring to? This presentation then seeks to historicize the structure of the modern and westernized university and how student movements that are related to, to, this, um, to this institution. In understanding the history of the, westernized, of the westernized university, which then became entangled with um, you know, uh, forms of domination and subjugation, we then are able to understand the emergence of black student movements in the form of black consciousness movement, in the form of roads must fall movement, in the form of fees must fall, and outsourcing must fall. So, my contention then, which is also the premise of my study, is that black students are indeed the agents of a decolonized and free education. So this presentation was inspired by the outline of 10 Thesis, which I call my Bible of um, decoloniality. And it was written by Maldonado Torres, and I think um, some, of, some of you might know him because he spent quite a number of months um, you know, imparting um, the, the concepts of decoloniality um, within our college itself, but also during the summer schools. So what Torres speaks about is um, the concept of coloniality and how coloniality uh, speaks to the radical transformation of the concepts of power, knowledge, and being, which then gives rise to coloniality of power, coloniality of knowledge, and coloniality of being. So how do these concepts then get translated into a curriculum and pedagogy of the university? Coloniality of power speaks to the university structure itself. And from the play, you already see what the structure of the, univer of the university is. There's a lecture room where at the podium, it's the lecturer, and the students are sitting, obviously, looking up to this, to this person who has the so-called all the knowledge that they wish to have. So that culture in itself seeks to alienate the student 
because number one, they don't see themselves in that curriculum. Number two, the knowledge that is being imparted doesn't reflect their existing experiences. The coloniality of knowledge then speaks also to the objectivity and methodology of teaching and learning. Um, when we do what we term field work in, in, in academia, the, the community is often seen as the field, which needs to be told, which needs to be, you know. Um, and the person who's doing the research is the one who has all the knowledge. You are stepping into this field, which has all the problems, but is never actually creating solutions to those problems. So when field workers enter the community space, they see themselves as objective, as not part of the community itself. And that is a colonial understanding of, um, of, 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 um, of knowledge because you see yourself as separate from the community space and you see yourself as separate from the experiences of that community. So the subject-object relationship or methodology that is used within the university system seeks to alienate the one who is seeking knowledge from those who are giving the knowledge. Coloniality of being then speaks to the existence and non-existence of people in time and space. What do I mean by that? Well, um, I shared an experience on Saturday about my, one of the courses that I did in my undergraduate, which I did at the University of Pretoria. And this was history. And in the history classroom, uh, society or civilization began with Greek civilization. So already the non-existence of Africa and other parts of the world shows that in time and space there was an, a, 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 a non-existent of certain people and certain being. So when we speak about the history of, 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 of people, we start, or the history of the world, it starts with Greek history. Now, what, one of the most important things when talking about coloniality, obviously, is to define concepts. So there's a difference between coloniality, colonialism, and colonization. And Torres says that coloniality is different from colonialism. Colonialism de denotes a political and economic relation in which the sovereignty of a nation uh, and people rests on the power of another nation. So it's, 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 um, it's like a, a, an ideology in a sense. Now, coloni colonization then becomes the systems and the structures and the policies that are created in order to sustain colonialism. Now coloniality then becomes the aftermath of that. You withdraw the, the nation, you withdraw the empire from, from, from the co colonized people, but what do you have left? And coloniality of power then, power, knowledge and being then speaks to the structures and culture of the, un coloniality of power then speaks to the structure of the university and coloniality of knowledge speaks to the methodology of teaching and learning and coloniality of being refers to the impact that colonialism has on the ontological and existential experience of the colonized people. So what it is that we experience after colonialism then becomes coloniality, which is what we obviously are experiencing now today. And one of the most powerful student movements of our time in post-apartheid South Africa, obviously, was the roads must fall because not only did it depict the alienation of black students within the academy, but also the, 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 their exclusion from the curriculum itself. So all roads lead to the colonization of the mind depicted the idea that the university space itself seeks to create students as non-existent in time and space, which is the current dispensation of post-apartheid South Africa. Then the education system and structure, like capitalism, inherently has class divisions, which are entangled with forms of domination and subjugation, which are racial in their orientation. So within the university space, there's, also, there's, 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 a, there's a, a structure of hierarchy and a zones of being and non-being. And those of you obviously who know, um, you know decolonial um, thinking, zones of being and non-being are racial orientation and racial um, you know, uh, modes of being, where whiteness is seen as the, high, the highest epitome of humanity and blackness seen, seen as the most um, inferior form of humanity. 
So the curriculum itself, then, it, it, it gives a distinction of the European man's view of the world as the highest view of which to view yourself or in which knowledge can be obtained. And I say this because as, as a student of political sciences, the greatest thinkers of all times within my discipline are white males from five countries in Europe. Britain, France, Italy, Spain, and the Americas. So those are the greatest thinkers of political sciences. And if you don't cite those thinkers, and if you don't um, you know, reference them, then you haven't said anything within political sciences. And I say this because when I decided to embark on my master's studies, and after I had attended the summer school, one of the things that I wanted to write about was my own personal experiences as, as a black Muslim woman living in South Africa. And the people within my discipline told me that that has nothing to do with political sciences. So already the system marginalizes students who want to write about themselves and who want to write about their experiences within the university system. So what then becomes a decolonial turn? within the context of curriculum and pedagogy. The curriculum and pedagogy of the westernized university perpetuates a state of war against black students. What do I mean by state of war? It teaches us that we don't belong in the university. So we constantly have to leave our identity at the entrance of the university gates because we need to assimilate into the structure and the culture of the university, to the coloniality of power and the coloniality of knowledge. Because whatever knowledge we have or that we come with into the university, it does not exist. So the university structure already teaches us when we enter into the system that whatever knowledge systems we have, they don't belong within the university and we need to forget who we are. So black students then in in the tribally constructed African university colleges during apartheid were banned from any political activity, um, political expression, and if they were caught engaging in such political activities, they were sub subjected to detention and banishment. And this is what we see in, 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 in modern schools today. When black people or black students express themselves in, in, in their native languages or in their cultures, they are taught that they're doing something wrong. I remember in high school, I was, I used to, we used to be given demerits, which was a form of punishment for speaking your own language, even on the corridors, not even in the classroom, but just walking up and down as students talking and relating to each other. But by merely um, you know, showing who you were and showing your identity and speaking from your location, you were told that there's something wrong with that. And you were given detention for that. So those, those forms of, of, of subjugation and, and, and marginalization still exist, even in the current um, education system that we, that we have in, in, in post-apartheid South Africa. So when you see um, Afrikaans Must Fall, which was also a movement of the 1976 um, Black Consciousness Movement, we ask ourselves, how is it that as black students we are still saying the same thing 24 years into democracy? Now, Decolonization requires the subject, which in this instance is the student or the black student, to emerge as a questioner, a thinker, and a knowledge producer. So st students need to reintroduce or introduce themselves and their knowledge into the curriculum and pedagogy. So black students cannot locate themselves in the current curriculum. We don't see ourselves, we don't see our ancestors, we don't see who we are as a black people in the current curriculum that we are reading. So it's as if um, you know, Africans were never scientists, Africans were never um, political thinkers, Africans were never economists. So how do we then transform curriculum, the, the curriculum and pedagogy? The history of education of black people has always been based on white values, white politics, white social conduct, white economic power, and the black student has been at the centerpiece of this absorption of, of this world. And this has been that way since apartheid because the Bantu Education Act of 1963 states, native education should be based on the principles of trusteeship, non-equality, and segregation. Its aims should be it, to inculcate the white man's view of life, especially that of the Boer, which is the senior trustee. 
So already the determination of what kind of education we receive as black people was enacted in law. Now, the problem with then coming in in a, po in a democratic society and not dismantling not just the laws itself, but also the structure and the culture of the university is that we run the risk of having students feeling alienated from the system 24 years after we claim that we're a democratic society. Now, what are we proposing? And what are the views of students that have come out of the workshop that we had? And one of the, 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 the biggest things that obviously we as students have proposed is the scholarship of activism. And this has to be a fundamental element of teaching and learning because we need to instill a decolonial attitude, not just only on academics, but also on students. When we introduce ourselves as students into the curriculum and we write about experi our experiences, there needs to be a scholarship of activism from the side of the, 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 the academics who are on the receiving end because we want to write about ourselves. We want to see ourselves documented and we want to see our history as a black nation being implemented and being um, reflected onto the curriculum. So the concept of each level of education of, um, of, of, of black children assuming that we don't have existing knowledge needs then to come to an end. And we need to then allow students to reflect their own knowledge and their own um, ideas within the system and from as early as um, undergraduate level. So what students have um, then proposed is that decoloniality needs to become a compulsory module, not only at honors level, but at undergraduate level, because we understand that this is a gradual introduction of, decolon of decoloniality and the project of decoloniality and having people go through and undergoing a decolonial turn, but it needs to start somewhere. And we need our ideas as students to be reflected from as early as, um, you know, undergraduate. And I'm saying this also because it's based on personal experience. When I, I wrote an, an, an article, um, I think in my second year, on, in, in one of my courses, political sciences, it was about uh, democratic ideas. And I wrote about the compatibility of Islam and democracy. And um, the response from my lecturer was that these two concepts cannot be reconciled. And that in itself was a subjective response because if I can see the compatibility between my religious views and democracy as a concept, who then is she to tell me that these two are not reconcilable terms? So already, um, you know, our lecturers are sitting from a posture of telling and dictating to students that where you are coming from, it cannot be allowed into the university space. And we are saying that that culture needs to end. That culture of the white man's view of the world being the epicenter of knowledge needs to then dismantle, be dismantled. And um, uh, Comrade Sindane, he, he, he used a very, very um, you know, strong term of epistemic suicide. Those are some of the things that we need to introduce within the system is that for people to allow for epistemic diversity, they need to then undergo epistemic suicide and to kill this idea that their knowledge is the supreme knowledge and that white knowledge is the supreme knowledge within the university system. I can tell you that the, 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 the disciplinary boundaries that we see within the system have created a sort of decadence because now we cannot um, think across disciplinary lines. You have to be confined within the discipline of political sciences because that's what you've been trained in. But when you look into history and you see thinkers like Karl Marx and um, uh, Thomas Hobbes, they are across disciplines. You find Thomas Hobbes in law, you find Thomas Hobbes in economics, you find you know, all these thinkers across disciplines, but when we as, as, as a people start thinking across disciplinary lines, we are then told that this is relegated to this particular discipline and cannot be cross-border. And that is, that is, that is um, you know, killing the motivation of students in, in a way because then we cannot move beyond what we, what, what we are taught within the university system. So we are taught to assimilate and to consume um, the white man's view of the world to a point where now as students we are, um, you know, 
embarking on epistemic disobedience. And what we are basically asking for the university is to allow the space and the culture of the university to reflect diversity and not the white man's view of the world. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sepesile Jojo. Sepesile Jojo from the Eastern Cape. Um, and I noticed some of you guys are getting tired. I'm also getting tired myself, eh? It's rough. You've been here the whole day. And I want to congratulate you for that. Well done. Um, and if you want, any time that you feel you're getting really tired, you can lift up your hand and I'll just sing you a song. But you have to say which song I can sing for you and which artist. If I know what that is on that condition. Now, I'm allowed to just go crazy on this presentation. You know why? Because it's decoloniality. Hey. Um, I'm kidding. I'm not going to go totally radical. Um, I do actually have some serious things to say, but I was just a side note. Okay, um, so I divided my presentation into three main parts, just to give a background of um, what decolonization and transformation in South Africa is about, um, to locate the discussion. Then I just highlighted some obstacles um, and some solutions, um, which I think could help with how we should um, decolonize our curriculum and our space. Okay, I've only got 10 minutes. Okay, so why decolonization and transformation? Um, as we all know, we all have gone through an oppressive apartheid system, some more than others, but um, the curriculum hasn't changed much, despite the fact that um, universities say in their policy frameworks, um, and I was in UCT before I came to UNISA, but they say in their policy frameworks that they're going to change, they're, they're going to transform, and they have these words about transformation and how they're going to Africanize the university, and it's a bunch of lies, really, because nothing much has changed. That's what the Department of Education said, not really me, which is quite sad. Um, so, yeah, that's why we're having this discussion. Um, you're free to disagree with me. I'm chilled with that. And, yeah, the fact that it, as the previous speaker said, it reinforces Western dominance. And it's, the worst thing about it is that it's not open to new bodies of knowledge. It demeans other bodies of knowledge and is full of stereotypes and patronizing views about Africa um, that I got from Heleta, Savo Heleta from NMMU. He's right about it. Um, there's lots of stereotypes in the curriculum which are not true about Africa, and that's exactly why we need academics like you and myself. Um, I'm doing honors in gender studies, by the way. Um, I hope to get into masters next year. But um, we need true things written about us, and we need the whole curriculum to change. I know that's not going to happen like that, but nonetheless, um, it's, worth, it's worth speaking about. So what does decolonization actually mean? To me, it means to embrace other knowledge systems and transform the way that we research, the way that we learn, and the methods that we use. In the words of Césaire, it's the rejection of consciousness, of the consciousness and values of the colonizers. And, and it and the colonizers had a rigidity about the way that they expressed their views about Africa and the way that they used their methods and researched and helped us to learn. Um, it's about justice. It's about Africanizing the curriculum. We're all African people. Therefore, I don't know, some people don't consider themselves African, I know, sitting in this room, but we're African. The bulk of South Africa is African. Therefore, our curriculums, are, not only our curriculums, but our spaces should be African. Um, so, we want to end structural dominance. Um, I'm not sure why it's taking so long, so long. It's actually quite sad. A lot of people are dying and the news is always so bad, you know? Um, but the reason why I'm speaking to you guys is because you're in a better position than I am to actually change what's happening in the university space, to change what we consume um, so that we can get to a point where we take in truth and are proud to actually interact with the curriculum and the education that we're, we're taking in. Not just being like, okay, cool, I'm just getting this assignment done. Bam, that's it. Um, education is such an important thing. 
and it happens in many different ways. Um, and it's so important for our education to speak to us and to speak to us from where we are in the situation that we're in now as a post-colonial country. Um, it's also to reverse and to change colonial, colonialism's damage, which demeaned everything non-European that was intellectually, historically, educationally, linguistically, and, and culturally. It means to put Africa at the center, in the words of Hunguki Wationgo. Um, it's about socio-economic transformation in the country. Um, I don't want to come with big words and jargon. That's not who I am. I'm just here to implore you and to ask you guys to try and consider ways that you can make the curriculum not just exciting. It's not about excitement here, um, although that's what I'd like it to be. It, it's, it's really about making the curriculum speak to us as a people and to to make sure that we don't get bored by it, to make it reflect us. I'm a black girl, I'm doing gender studies now, and, and all of my authors that I have to read for my assignments are most of them, 80%, European. So that renders me, unfortunately, and rudely invisible. You know, it's, it, it's just so sad. You know, I'm sitting there doing gender studies, yay, feminism, yay, let's stop gender-based violence, and now I have to read about um, Western people and the way that they write about issues about feminism. How many of you know that black feminism and Western feminism is something totally different? They don't face the same issues because they live in two different parts of the world. The other one sometimes lives in a shack and sometimes, you know, doesn't have a job and gets raped a lot more, you know? The other one has a more privileged existence. Her problems are more like I don't know, misbehaving children, or I don't know. I'm not a mother. But the point is that um, people are in different locations. And these different, um, there are different things which make up our identity. And as they intersect, they give us different experiences. And we can't speak for others. And we can't just, it can't all just be Western. It's actually quite rude. I'm going to be quite frank. I don't, this is the only time I have to talk to you guys. You know, so I'm going to make the best of it. Cool, so um, some obstacles to decolonization of the curriculum and transformation in South Africa. The first one I highlighted was there's a huge opposition, and I'm not sure why, to the change which is entrenched in university structures. There's an unwillingness to change that is lacking. I assume that's actually associated with the power that white males have because they finance a lot of these um, huge institutions. Um, they have a lot of money. We all know this. Not all of them, but most of them do. And they have a, because they have a lot of money, they have a lot of command. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure why there's an unwillingness to, to change the curriculum into something which reflects who we are. We are black people. We are African. We are Tsonga. We are Indian. We are Tswana. We are Sutu. We are Kosa. We are Zulu. And we're not finding ourselves in the, decon in, in the curriculum. We're not finding ourselves in the, in the methods. An example is that my grandmother used to love to tell stories, um, to communicate. She was more into what Dando would call oratia. Um, and she would tell stories. And that was the best way she could communicate some of her ideas about life. I learned so much from her. And not to be able to engage and to, and now this is, a methodology suggestion to you guys to allow us to tell stories. But Arja, maybe we can send voice notes to you guys about the ways that we, when we have to answer a question. Because some of us are better speakers than writers. This writing thing, is not, it's not negative, but some of us are actually better speakers than writers. Um, I also think that's the same case with you guys as well. I think that some of you are better speakers than writers. Every human being has their own, um, own different strength and it, we can't just sort of blanketly say okay cool you must all write and then that you can go to your masters because you wrote an amazing th thesis I'd like to speak my thesis in fact I'd like to sing it because I'm a singer okay um, I'd like to express who I am and I'm not saying let's go full freedom let me just paint my thesis out like he's doing you know I'm not saying let's go buck wild I'm just saying that we need to give space to different personalities and different cultures 
and in so doing, show that we are proud to have so many different ways to express ourselves in South Africa. And let it not be a taboo thing. It's not taboo to speak or to tell stories about a certain concept, Western feminism, African feminism. It's so natural. You go to the rural areas, you know, you go to different parts of South Africa. People are using different ways of communicating and getting messages across. And it's not writing because so many of us anyway are illiterate. And that's the truth. Many of us speak African languages only. Okay. So, as you can see, this is a topic I'm so passionate about. Okay, so in my words, it's justice and it's Africanizing the curriculum. Um, so, the other problem is that there are powerful people and interest groups who will do all in their power to make sure the curriculum stays the same. And that's why I'm begging you and imploring you guys just to speak against them. I'm too young to do that. I've only got an honors, don't even have a master's yet. No PhD, nothing. You guys can oppose them. You're in some sort of position to influence what happens in the curriculum. So please do something about it, okay? Um, because when I have a child, I'd love to have two daughters and one son. And when they learn, I'm not married yet, I hope to be, okay? Um, but. I really hope that they will be able to sit in a closer classroom and learn in their own language because I don't, you know, I don't even, you can hear my accent is so British, you know, it's so British, let's have some tea, you know, and, and like I went to a Model C school and this is how people were speaking, so I assimilated that language. It would have been nice, my parents taught me Corsa and then left because they had to work, so we had no Corsa assimilation, then we went to school, then we began speaking like this, yeah, 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 dude, and that's great, we can speak, but we can't speak in our native language, in our, in our mother tongue, you know? So what I'm saying to you guys is that please embrace it, even if you're not black, you know, and, and that you can make the difference. It's you guys, you're the leaders, you're at the front line of society, you're writing about how we should teach, how we should do this thing. You, you guys are sin the ones sitting in meetings being talked about about decoloniality. So please really have a think about how you can actually do this. Um, okay, the other obstacle is that um, staff and academics don't understand the battle and therefore can't contribute meaningfully. There was a lady here who walked out. Um, this may be contentious, but I'm gonna say it anyway. This is my one chance. Um, she, she was white and she was walking out. I'm not sure she was, if she was distracted about what, nom, um, not Nomfundo, that's from the play, um, from what, what Nwabisa was saying um, about black people and expressing blackness and et cetera and how it's been pushed down and how we need to you know, r rise up and et cetera. And I thought to myself, you know, because okay, there are black people here, but the most people who need to hear it are white, you know? You guys, and, and white people, they show their guilt in different ways. You guys have better lives than us. And it's like, you know, great, you know? But the point is that now, she's the one that actually needs to hear this. More than anything, you, you guys have blackness within you. White people, you guys are just at the top of society. And you know, like, why are you walking out and why are you, and, and this is my question. It's always been my question since 13, experiencing racism as a black girl with dark, dark skin is, why are you guys being blind to what happens in society? You consider yourselves human. You know, you consider yourselves human, you, you say you're human, and then you do nothing about the suffering that's happening in this country. Like people are dying on the daily, we're seeing in the news, people in shacks, they burned down because the candle, you know, broke down and et cetera. Like, what, what's going on? I don't understand this kind of psyche of just like turning a blind eye to the suffering in this world. And I'm not, I feed the homeless, I do. So it's not like I'm doing nothing. You know, and we can sit in our comfortable chairs, you're gonna go home today, oh great talk, TNL Festival, they did a play, but like what are you guys doing about what you've been given? God has given you, whether you believe in God or not, I do, God has given you, or the system has given you enough privilege to drive a car, to teach people, and I know you have kids, so you're sustaining a family, and that's great, I want kids too. But the point is, what are you doing about the state of this country? You know, you're in a leadership position, and leadership is a responsibility. You know, it's, it's a chance to make a difference. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand, maybe you can make me understand. I'm gonna give five seconds, you can come and make me understand. 
I just never get it. Okay, cool, I'm gonna carry on with my conversation. Um, the other thing is that there's a lack of African ac academics who will rewrite the history of South Africa. Lots of, been, lots of things have been said about us which are untrue and we're hoping that correct things will be written about us um, and things and, and scholarship will be produced that develops African languages and, and we hope that that will be in universities. Number five, um, from my own personal experience, I told you about my gender studies honors um, and then the fact that there are European and research methods which are inflexible. So the research method that methods that we use, qualitative, quantitative, they're really rigid and I hope that you guys can find ways of making them a bit more flexible to cater to all of us and our different diversities. We speak about South Africa, South Africa being a diverse place, you know? And a diverse place means that there's diverse cultures and et cetera. That means that people have diverse ways of expressing themselves and I hope that you guys can reflect that within academia. Um, and then number seven, gender perspective is, sorry, um, from a gender perspective, I wanna say that also, um, sorry, I'm losing my trail of thought now because I just got so angry. Okay, cool, I'm gonna go to some solutions. I'm not a bearer of bad news, but like I'm usually a very positive person but also I get really angry at injustice. Um, but yes, let me, I'm gonna spend most of my talk just on, on solutions, the how. How do we tackle these problems? Um, and I hope that you won't just like flip over them and be like, you know, okay, cool, that's a great idea. Nod your head, you know. I hope you will do something. At least take one thing that I say seriously and think about it at home and think how you can implement it in your space. You don't have to go out to an NGO and be like, okay, cool, I wanna volunteer, let me get a t-shirt and hand out soup. No, just like in your space where you are, you know? I'm just an honest student, but I, I feed the homeless, you know? So that's where I am, that's what I can do, you know? I have to finish all my assignments, so yeah. Cool, um, so the first one is accountability. So the movement slash students slash even academics, I'd say, because I believe that you are in this fight too. Um, the movement must find ways to hold institutions accountable. We need to hold you guys accountable. And I hope that we don't have to after this talk. I hope that you'll just do it. I don't know, maybe I'm too idealistic here. Um, number two, we need to redefine our space. 20 years after apartheid, we must define our space, take off colonial images, names, and symbols. Um, our bodies don't belong to colonizers anymore. Um, and I want to say to white people sitting here that I know that you guys have been hearing this decolonization thing and it must be like uncomfortable to have this conversation, but it was also uncomfortable for us to have to speak English and to learn it at like grade two level and have to read English books when we just were learning in Corsa as we were growing up. I know that it's an uncomfortable conversation, but the point is that you guys live in a country where there's so many different cultures and you need to acknowledge that. It's about humanness. You cannot sit here and then be like, okay, cool, I'm human, and then not be able to identify and, and do something about the ones who are trying to be human in the space. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. And then I, I believe that there needs to be a focus about how we're going to decolonize the curriculum. Um, I also thought that as a, a solution, we need to embrace the self. So as African people, we need to be proud of who we are. And if we're not proud, and we don't know where we come from, because some of us don't actually, is Tagazolo Z to us Zaz. We're having this dynamic of children who are going to Crawford and rich schools and speak like this all the time. What's your name? Alupeli. That's how they pronounce their closer names. Go Alupeli, Jenna. Okay, cool. So. Um, it's about self-knowledge, it's about, I don't believe that black people are proud enough to be who they are. I believe that they possess a shame um, from different, all the years of mental slavery. Um, I'm running out of time. I'm sure you've had enough of me. Should I stop now? Okay, cool, all right. <laughs> Yo, okay, at least you were genuine. Um, and then I also want to say that I would call for declassing society to end inequality. There's a lot of inequality in the space of South Africa. The poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer. And I believe that if, because inequality and the whole classing society, lower class, middle class, and upper class are 
it, it, it promotes this thing of there's someone more important than the other. No one is better than the other. I believe that. We were all born with potential and then we were born into a system that sort of molded us into these different classes. I'm gonna close with just saying that the truth is not an easy thing to hear. Um, and, and those who take what I say into consideration, take it. But those who don't, that's fine as well. Ignorance is bliss. But I hope that as lecturers and people who are African, or who are in South Africa, that is, that you can try as leaders in the front line of education, try and, and, and change what this looks like for us, because we have less power. Um, yeah. Thank you. My name is Ntando Sindane. I'm a student at the College of Law. I'm doing my master's in law. The, you know when you're doing your master's, you change your title 15 times before you submit. So currently, the title of my master's is Decolonizing Intellectual Property Law, Copyright and the Indigenous Knowledge, knowledge Myth. Now, before I became an academic, I used to criticize academics for one thing, and I hope I'm not going to be like them. I used to criticize academics for writing papers for other academics. You write a paper, your paper is published in a journal that nobody ever reads except for other academics. Now the problem with academia in, to in total is that one day UNISA will employ me, give me a nice office with a nice view, I will sit in that office, close my door, discover abstract problems in society, and come with equally abstract solutions. That is not what I want to do. I would want to discover real solutions for real people and my solutions need to contribute to society. The presentation I'm going to make is in two. First, I want to talk about, just a little bit about what I'm researching about. Then secondly, generally decolonizing of the broader curriculum. As a point of entry, I want to say that when we decolonize or transform, we need to be intraspecific. We can't use a big broom and say we're decolonizing higher education and expect that that broom is going to sweep everything clean. We need to look at the Department of, uh, of the Employment Equity Division within the university and say, how can we transform or decolonize this? For now, I'm committed to decolonizing copyright law. Now, the former dean of the College of Law is here. Uh, you must just, uh, if I say something wrong, you must say, point of order, point of order. Now, copyright, a basic uh, layman's language of copyright. If I create a movie today, I can get copyright protection for that movie meaning that I register a copyright so that nobody can reproduce that movie without my permission, or nobody can make money from that movie without me knowing about it. Now, you have indigenous knowledge systems or traditional cultural expressions. Currently in South Africa, there's a view that we need to protect traditional cultural expressions. But there's a lot of smoke and mist because we want to use the Copyright Act 98 of 1978, which is really an adaptation of the 1846 Act of Britain. Now, what is the problem with this? Our traditional cultural expression, uh, colleagues and friends, or comrades and friends, can't be protected using um, Eurocentric acts. I want to give an example of Iguicho, what Kosa people know as Iguicho, or those songs that are sung by girls when they are going to Mkoso Mshanga. For those of you who are white, Mkoso Mshanga is traditional virginity testing. Or those songs that are sung by young men when they are going to initiation school. You can't protect those songs. Why can't you protect them or those stories or those poems? Number one, in copyright law, you've got what we call the material embodiment requirement. For you to be able to protect uh, anything using copyright, 
it is not the ideas that are protected, but it is the expression of ideas. Meaning that if you have got a song, it must be recorded and put into a CD before the law can protect you. Why is this problematic in the context of South Africa or Africa in general? Like the previous speaker has said, in Africa we have got a strong culture of orature. Stories were told to us by our forefathers, our grandmothers, and they were in orature. That means they were oral. Does it mean they don't have to be protected? Does it mean that African knowledge systems are of low quality? Now, with this material embodiment requirement, we then fall short of protecting African indigenous knowledge systems. Now, how to decolonize? I'm a very practical person. How do you then decolonize uh, the act or the teaching, rather, of material embodiment? The space needs to embrace the fact that there are different ways of knowing. You must not, and because if you don't know, it means I'm confusing you and I'm that academic who writes for other academics. Secondly, the other problem with copyright currently, or the Eurocentric understanding of copyright, is that it understands or it perceives ownership to be individualistic. It says, Ndando Sindane can produce a, a play now and register the copyright and he will own that play. But in our African traditions, ownership, the modes of ownership and custodianship are more communal. I'm going back to the songs that, were cre for, that are sang during initiation school. They were created 300 years ago by a group of people, not individuals. So the moment you say you want to copyright Iguijo or who is going to own it? Because they are owned by a group. You, I want to give you an example. You might know that, uh, or you might have heard that uh, Louis Vuitton, I'm sure there are many professors here who wear Louis Vuitton and Versace and all of those uh, expensive uh, labels. <coughs> Louis Vuitton went to Lesotho and took the traditional Basotho blanket, put the Louis Vuitton sticker and sold uh, that blanket for how much? Was it 38,000 or 40,000? Now, people are arguing that Louis Vuitton must pay money to the Basotho people. Now, the current copyright regime or the current Eurocentric copyright uh, understanding is problematic because who then is a Musutu and who's not a Musutu? Because in South Africa, you have a large group of Basutu people, just as you have Basutu people in Lesotho. And if Louis Vuitton is going to pay, who is going to pay it? Wh whom are they going to pay? Now, comrades and friends, uh, colleagues and compatriots, Minangilindebele from Pumala. But uh, in my blood, there's a bit of Sutu, there's a bit of Corsa, there's a bit of Zulu. Louis Vuitton must also pay me. Now, that is to highlight the confusion that is currently there in the Eurocentric understanding of copyright. Now, let me go to the second part. I, I told you I'm still doing my master's. I don't have full solutions yet, but I'm highlighting where the problems are. Now, I'm going to give just two solutions for copyright. And, and uh, Professor Song, uh, who's the former dean, uh, I can assure you I've written a paper on this. There are footnotes and there's an extensive bibliography. I presented it and it was peer reviewed. So I'll share that. Right now, I didn't want to be very technical. But firstly, the first solution is the sui generis avenue. That is to say, we must take the Copyright Act 98 of 1978 and put it aside completely when talking about traditional cultural expressions. Because Queen Elizabeth does not know everything. And Queen Elizabeth and Buckingham Palace were wrong on that. So we need to sit down together and say, first, answer two questions. The first question, 
are these traditional cultural expressions protectable? Secondly, are the African principles in protecting them? Now, before maybe I go to the second one, I have a problem with commodification of culture. Because the day we discover who Louis Vuitton must pay to, and we have identified that this Basutu blanket is intricately connected to the culture of Sutu people, we would be agreeing to the commodification of our cultures. We should be an anomaly. We should demean Africans. So those are some of the questions we need to respond to. The second uh, solution is moral rights. Now, moral rights in intellectual property law is a call for two things. Firstly, and moral rights must be a solution temporary while we're debating what to do with traditional cultural expressions. Moral rights says one thing. Firstly, Louis Vuitton must acknowledge the source. That is to say, they must say, we are not that smart. We did not design this blanket. We went to Southern Africa. We found them wearing this, and this the history of this blanket is one, two, three. The second thing about moral rights is to say, Louis Vuitton must not distort the blanket. It must not now put, if the blanket was blue, it must not make it yellow. Because if the blanket is connected to our culture, and then they distort it, it means they're distorting our culture. Vumanbo. Now, the more broader uh, solutions. I said 10 minutes, Dr. Zawad, and I'm keeping it. The, I've got five solutions for, and these are not mine. On Saturday, we had a group of students. I must acknowledge the source, otherwise I'm stealing their intellectual property. With a group of students, and they said that when you go on Monday, present these solutions for general curriculum decolonizing and transformation. Number one, which has been touched on by the latter speakers, we need to decolonize methodology, the methodology of teaching. And what a better place to start than language. Comrades and friends, colleagues and compatriots, I can assure you that, uh, of course, I finished my, my LLP in record time, but I can assure you that I finished it in record time, but I was those 50% students, I don't have a distinction. I can assure you, Dr. Chaluf, that I would have passed my LLP cum laude if it was taught to me in Isindebel. Yeah. There's no mistakes about that. You know, there's a violence on black students, and I'm not going to apologize to white colleagues for saying this. There's a violence on black students. When we come to school or university, before we learn the content of law, before we learn the content of math, we need to learn English first. Whereas white students, on the other hand, they are taught Veskander, Naturlake Vettenskap, Physice Vettenskap. They are taught in a language that they grew up with. Now, if you want to decolonize the, the method of teaching, you start with language. And it's very sad in UNISA. I think in UNISA, let me be very practical, uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Zawad. You have a whole department of Africans here. You have a whole department of English. And then African languages are clubbed together in one department of African languages. Now, if this university, comrades and friends, is serious about a decolonizing methodology, they must shut down English department and shut down African department, use those resources into uh, supporting indigenous languages. And it's not because we hate white people or we hate Africans or we hate English. We don't. Africans is not where it is today because God loves it so much. Africans is where it is today because between the period of 1940 and 1960, a group of African intellectuals came together at Stellenbosch, sat down and decided that oh, we're going to develop this language. They wrote Bibles, they wrote poems, they wrote stories, they developed African community radio stations. It won't die. So shut down that department, shut down English, shut down Africans, replace it with Sisutu, replace it with Isizulu, 
Let the Zulu intellectuals and Sisut intellectuals come together and develop it. I don't want to uh, dwell more. You've, I've made my point here. Yeah. The second uh, solution towards decolonizing is to conscientize policymakers. And my, my, my sister, especially who spoke just before me, uh, put this point very beautifully by saying people who are obstacles to transformation, you, they need to be conscientized. Nobisa said the decolonial module must, be, must start from undergrad. I put it to you, and I, I wouldn't be a lawyer if I don't say I put it to you. I put it to you that the vice chancellor of this university and all universities must go back to class and be taught decolonial discourse. Because, because, and I'm not saying this to be disrespectful, you must stop me, Dr. Zawada, if I'm saying wrong things. I'm not saying this to be disrespectful, because it is people in big spaces, in, 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 in top offices, who are expected to decolonize. But they are clueless about what decolonizing is. Take them back to class, educate them. And if they don't want, and this was said by students, not me, if they don't want, all these professors that are here, black and white, if they don't want to do a module in decolonizing, they must go. They must retire. I can see you are frowning now. <laughs> but the conscientizing must not only be limited to leaders of the university. Also, the Department of Higher Education, politicians who have a loud mouth who say a lot of things, they need to be taught. Because when you listen to some ministers whose names I will not mention here for my safety, uh, they listen to students saying decolonize, decolonize, but they don't have a clue what decolonizing is. So teach them. The third uh, solution is to insist on an interdisciplinary approach to all studies. The moment you have scientists, and use science, uh, uh, the moment you have engineers and scientists who don't have an idea of social sciences, you are going to have people making atomic bombs that are going to kill all of us. Because all they are concerned about is theories and uh, formulas. They don't know the human impact that these formulas are going to have on our world. So if you are doing an, a degree in engineering or Bachelor of Science, you must do a bit of philosophy, you must do a bit of this and a bit of that. So we need to be interdisciplinary and embrace intersectionality. The fourth solution, and I think Noavisa spoke a bit about this, students must be encouraged to immerse themselves into the content of the study. Academics are lazy. I hope I'm not going to be one of them. Academics give you an assignment. Am I wasting time, Dr. Zawad? Ms.Ako, no, thanks for that uh, thumb. She, she did this, it means I'm not taking too much time. Academics give you an assignment. And when they mark that assignment, they've got a memorandum. Meaning that when you have deviated from the memorandum, they're not really concerned whether your response is right or wrong. You get wrong. Now, the method of questioning in assignments needs to encourage the student to give their own views, give their own perceptions. And this is not only in human sciences, by the way, uh, or in humanities, even in physics. Who's the name of that doctor who was here at summer school uh, who said must decolonize math and science? Professor Raj. Students must be, the, the content of the, the work that students are, are, are taught needs to reflect who they are. I'll make an example. Currently in, I attended a Quiltbeck seminar at the College of Law. Currently all teachings on LGBTI, lesbian, gay, transgender, and intersex are very wide you'd assume that it's only white people who are gay in this country. Yet the violence that is imputed on black people in Kailicha, 
in Klazaj, in Chakastad, in Orchis, and all of it's not spoken about. You, you'd assume that it's only white people. So we need to immerse ourselves. We need to be open. The last solution for purposes of this paper, and this one is very controversial, so listen very carefully. I don't want you to say I've said something that I've not said. Colonialism, comrades and friends, benefited white people. And you must be honest about that. If Helen Ziller told you something different, she's wrong. There was nothing good about colonialism. It was bad on the black body, and it benefited white people. So, obviously, the antithesis to this, when we say we're, going, we're decolonizing, it is going to cause a discomfort for who? White people. Because it's going to remove them from their position of privilege. Now, everywhere in society, starting from the university, white people must warm up to the idea of committing suicide. Not a physical suicide. Don't kill yourself. Two types of suicide. The first one is epistemic suicide. Form your own groups as white people and say Africans must fall at the University of Pretoria. And when you form that group, that group must not come and be in solidarity with us. We know what we're doing as black people. We have set our own agenda. As white people, have your own groups and say, our language has been dominant for this long. We need to create space for indigenous languages. We want Africans to fall at the University of Pretoria, at Stellenbosch University, at Elsenberg College, and everywhere else where bastions of Afrikaner intellectualism are created. That is epistemic suicide that you must commit as white people. I'm not sorry for these views. The second type of suicide that you must commit is class suicide. You must realize that you are in a position of privilege economically. And you must then form groups as white people alone, not in solidarity with us. We're going to do our own program. We know our own agenda. And say, this economy, this wealth, we took, or our forefathers took from black people violently. The least we can do is to expropriate economy, nationalize the economy, and share wealth evenly with black people. If white people don't do that, it means white people are not really serious about decolonizing. Lastly, this is my last, this is my parting shot. By white people, I don't only mean those who are paid. If you are a vice chancellor of the University of South Africa or UJ or wherever, and your agenda is entrenching whiteness and protecting white privilege, you are as white as they are. So you yourself, you must also commit a class suicide and commit an epistemic suicide because you yourself are an impediment you are blocking the progress of decolonizing. I think I must pause here for now. Is that fine, Dr. Zahad? I want to thank those of you who have stayed the course. And I think you've learned something. What, what I, and I've had such fun working with the students. One of the things we wanted to do in this session was not for me to chair the session and then call them one by one. I wanted them to, they, they were in charge. I hope you saw that. And so we tried to decolonize the session in that way. Um, but there are a few things which I have to say before I, I close off today. Um, the first one is a number of them referred, Professor Sonka, Oh, you, actually one of the things we decided on Saturday is that we don't do that thing because it means you... <laughs> where's, the, where's the... Do you know where the... It's not here. It's, 
faith is strength. For this Sandra, can you speak loudly? Thank you. I'd like to thank my visa, Joy Group, Sindai, who else spoke? I think I would like to really thank them. I, I think that they, they shared their views and uh, some also thought provoking comments. And uh, I, I agree with most of the things that they said, but I also have. I disagree with some of the things that they, they said as well. Uh, I think we, we need also to reflect and, uh, on, on what's happening in the country and ask ourselves why we are still complaining about other people being more privileged than we are, given the fact that we have been independent <coughs> for 25 years or more. It's nothing compared to uh, the situation of colonialism. But I want to ask us to ask ourselves is what have we done as black people to empower ourselves in ways that also uh, dislocate us from this thing of always being oppressed? Or what is it that you are doing? And I think it's something that we need to really reflect on. But also I want us to, to remind ourselves that the Noibisas, the Sindanis, and the Jojos are also part of the landscape and they have a contribution to make. So it cannot be all the time we want you to lead us. We want, because if you look at liberation movements, especially of the youth, they are the, also the ones who contributed to changes. And we would like also for them to be able to exercise that agency in ways that also help us uh, to move this agenda, 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 agenda forward. And I think that is something that also we need to always remind ourselves. But lastly, uh, in as much as I agree with them to say that we still have vestiges of racism, racism, overt and covert, and, and, and we, want, we need to address that. But there's another monster that's rearing its head that we do not want to acknowledge, and that is tribalism and sexism. And, and it is also not merely a, like black or white, it's also black on black sexism, black on black tribalism, and we're not addressing that. And if we're not addressing that, we'll find ourselves in a situation like other African countries, in, you know, like where there was civil war, because those are the things that they never uh, tried to address and I think we're making the same mistake as well to say, yes, we have racism, but what about this monster that's rearing its ugly head? If you look at the way there's abuse of women, abuse of children, and those are the things, and it's not you know, across the races, it's interracial as well. And I think it is important as we have these conversations also not to forget that, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sanmonan assignment. Maguye kukukudwe eligama le decoloniality. Uba liti ninge sinu. Igama eli decoloniality. Liti ninge sinu. Okunye nfunu kukucho kukuba. Leendo mainga kadi pezu. Kumelisi we na sezanzi. Ngobu ya fumanu bezu kolwe ni mbazo pushu wa kubaba fundi singesi. Kabe figa eteshiari bapinde bafunde. Ulumiluago, Abama Luas. Nandinga Chupana Kuma Ate, Kukuki, Ababa Tabakadi, Lendaba, Pekel is a decoloniality. Babaka Bakale, Bashkalu, Ekama, Eli, Ukuba, 
Kulolulwimi esunalo au levele South Africa. Icho ukutimi ngolwimi ngalumi. Ukuze manga vale tutachi suwa panti. Anabase makaya ba ikondi sisi uguba iteta ukutimi. Ngoba kasi iteta apa ngesi ngesi. Anfulu kuposisa. Anifanga nengi daba itetile. Ngoba basati base kolonize still. Ngoba uba bendi ngabo ngendi tete ngolu mluwa. And another thing that I want to share is that in language, ye Africans, I don't think that that is African language. Um, the ninzi luimi ze Africans emzanzi Africa. Ye Africans agusili ilo ulumi luita. Eninga kusho ukuba, nwabisa, chocho, zingisa, kombrek sindani, and my friend, nige ni ambe, kia lili kalule edi kama, ukuba nge sintu, litini, kani teta nge dekoloniality. Fuchu kususala na mkhanje, going forward, nga pinde niste tele nge singi, sisa kaila ba. You'll have to summarize for us a little bit. I need to to close the session. Okay, are you coming in the booth? Sorry? No. Any other questions? Are there any other questions? Sorry. Can I... Okay. I don't see anybody who's got any other questions, but you... It will be here tomorrow, so I'm assuming you'll also be here so that the others can engage you over tea or coffee or what. Yes, thank you. No, um, but I, can I just, um, I don't want to respond uh, or answer because there's no right and wrong answers, but um, to Professor Songa, you know, the issue of uh, what we have done as blacks, the coloniality of of power in itself, like I said, it's a structure. And we are living in a time of coloniality itself. I wanted to make a drawing. Sinisa, don't you have on a pen up or, or what were you guys writing with this? On that board. I wanted to do a diagram um, representation of what it is that is stopping blacks from empowering themselves, particularly within the structure of coloniality because we haven't decolonized. We, there's no decolonization. Decolonization is the myth of the 21st century, as Professor Grossfugger would say. We are still colonized. So we are living within coloniality. We are living, breathing, and, and, and still existing within coloniality. So for us to even imagine ourselves as being empowered as black people is impossible because the structure itself has entrenched, has been entrenched, not only within the university system itself, but also in, 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 in how we, we, we see ourselves as black people. And this diagram, I, 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 you know, and academics need to be decolonized. This thing of thinking that the summer school is for postgraduate students and undergraduate students, it's also a myth because you are the ones who are saying, what is decolonization, what is transformation, and yet when the summer school is being held to actually expound on what it is we are talking about when we are saying decoloniality, none of them attend. We don't see these faces there. So it becomes problematic for us to want to now come here and present about what is coloniality when we don't even understand. When we speak about the zone of being, zone of being, sorry, my English is, is terrible. We are speaking about, it's, 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 it's a racial structure, but when we talk about whiteness, it's, it's, a, it's a mental condition, which then also affects black people. That's why Usindane said, even vice chancellors and even professors who associate themselves with whiteness are in themselves white. During apartheid, they were called non-whites because they, well, Steve Bigo didn't want to call them black because they were not conscious about their state of blackness and their state as black people. So they called them non-whites. So when we are talking about a zone of being 
and a zone of non-being. Zone of non-being. We are speaking of people who are below a certain existence. In the zone of being, it's white men, white women, and white children. Zone of non-being, it's everything black. Whether you are a vice chancellor, whether you are a, a domestic worker, you belong here. Because whiteness in itself has created a, con a psychological condition of relegating anything that is not white to a zone of non-being. So you are like an animal within the, the context of coloniality. So for you to imagine yourself here in the first place, it, the, the system doesn't allow it. That's why we have people who, who uh, have developed a term called a better black syndrome. Blacks who think they are here, they belong here. You will never be here because even here you will never be recognized as being human, no matter how close to whiteness you are. No matter how many white suburbs black people can live in, they will never be white because whiteness doesn't accept you. And that is why we will never develop as a black people because we are constantly trying to assimilate to a world that is constantly rejecting us. So coloniality in itself, it's a condition. And we need to create a consciousness. Decoloniality, it's an attitude. That's why we talk about a decolonial turn. It's a mental attitude because we need to turn away from whiteness itself. We should not aspire towards this because this is what maintains the structure of coloniality. This is what perpetuates the war against black people. That's why as students, whenever we come into the system, we're forever going to forget ourselves and take on this black accent and not be able to express ourselves because the best way to express ourselves in such spaces is to speak English. Unfortunately, no, Zuko, as far as it is illuminated because Gufunega says explain to whiteness what do we mean, what are we saying when we're talking about decoloniality and coloniality. And the space itself doesn't speak to our existence. That's why I said coloniality of being speaks to the non existence and the existence. In this space, we don't exist as black people. That's why we have to speak English, unfortunately. And these are the spaces we need to decolonize. And these are the structures that we need to decolonize. And it takes baby steps. I mean, like Uprof said, we've been colonized for over 300 years. So for us to expect ourselves to be decolonized in 24 years, it's mission impossible. But we have to start somewhere. And we are saying we must start by putting ourselves in the curriculum and speak from where we are as students in order to force those academics to go, to go read Achille Mbembe, to go read those decolonial scholars. Because if we don't force you, if we don't force ourselves into this curriculum, you're never going to read those people. You're never going to read about our culture. You're never going to read about our stories if we don't force ourselves. So we are saying it must be a top-down approach. As students, we must force ourselves violently so, if need be. We must force ourselves into the curriculum. And as academic, academics, you must then be forced to respond to ourselves, forcing ourselves into that curriculum. Meaning you must go read who we are talking about, who our grandmothers are, who our great-grandmothers are. Because if you don't, then you must go, like Sindani said. She says with a smile. <laughs> Colleagues, ooh. We've come to the end of the session, but before I end, I just want to, to do a number of things. Sorry, there's water here, so I think. I want to draw your attention to Zingisa. Just turn it on. Nko Sinkulu, who's a doctoral student in visual arts. And he's expressing himself visually. One of the things we said is that there are different forms of knowledge and different forms of expressing ourselves. There's the verbal, there's the oral, musical, visual, and visual as well. One of the things why we wanted to include the, the exhibition of the master's student in the, in the program is that the master's in visual arts has been transformed to include a component of actual art making. Up until about 2012, the master's and doctorate program in visual arts was just a written thesis. And we then changed the curriculum so that it, it includes actual art making. So that visual expression, which also gets examined by the doctorate by three external examiners is part of the doctorate. So if you do have time, that exhibition is going to be up for the next two or three weeks. So if you don't get time today or tomorrow, Please, please do yourself a favor and go and look at our Masters in Visual Art exhibition. 
Those students actually win competitions worldwide. Thank you. We'll see you at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning.